Uh, welcome everyone to the Ontology Summit 2020. This is the fall series. Uh, it's November 6, 2019. And today um, I'm very, gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, um, Professor Elise Stickles who is an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. And she is a cognitive semanticist, which means that she studies the relationship between linguistic meaning and form from a cognitive functional perspective. So today she's going to be talking to us about the MetaNet repository and the project associated with it. Um, in which um, metaphors are extracted from natural language text. And uh, she is the co-PI, is that right, of this project. And uh, so I'll, so Elise, take over. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I'll turn off my video in a second, but um, first I just wanted to say a couple things um, about my background. So as Ken mentioned in his introduction, um, I just started um, here at UBC. Um, I did my PhD in linguistics at UC Berkeley and um, this project I started working on as a graduate student, um, continued working on it when I was a postdoc and now I'm transitioning hey, to the- Wednesday, November 6th, uh, the Ontolog oh. Forum. This is Elise Stickles from- What is that? University of Br oh, okay. <laughs> So um, now I'm going to become um, one of the co-PIs along with um, a professor at UC Berkeley. So uh, my role in this started out largely as one of the linguistic analysts, meaning more on the theoretical side of things. Um, and so I am not the computational expert on the project per se, so I may be a little light on some of the technical details. Um, so what I'm going to be focusing on today is largely the um, theoretical framework that we're working in and then um, talk about some of the implementation. And for those of you who can see me on video, my cat is sitting here, that's Indy, so that's why there's little ears in and out of the frame. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, share my slides now and then turn off the video. Okay, so can people see this? And yes. which version can you see? Because for some reason it went to present review. Looks very good. Okay, so you can see, see just the regular kind, not the present review? Correct. Yeah, regular okay. kind. Great. Um, the present review is just harder to read. All right. Okay, so um, like I said, I'm going to be presenting on um, providing basically a overview of MetaNet. Um, I will get into a lot of details as to how the repository is designed, that will be the focus today, um, and the metaphor extraction process that makes use of the repository. That's actually where I'll get more into details of some of the implementation. Um, and then if there's time during the question section, I've included a set of slides at the end um, kind of describing some of the studies and data analysis we've done using this um, system. I don't plan on going over those. Um, they're there for you to read if you're, you're interested or if you wanna ask questions, um, we can do that. All right, so a very brief history of MetaNet. Um, this was started in 2012 as part of um, uh, the IARPA metaphor program, so that's Intelligence, Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Administration. Um, so they funded um, several sites to do um, kind of exploratory metaphor research. And this was originally a very large project um, spanning across at least four institutions. I might be missing someone in there. Um, so the computational linguistics teams were 
um, mostly at um, UC Berkeley and the International Computer Science Institute, which is at Berkeley and affiliated with UC Berkeley. Um, and there were also linguists at Merced, and then we had a um, psychology team at um, UC San Diego. So it was initially quite large, and um, the project lasted in this state for about three years. So the initial objectives as um, determined by the government were to build this multilingual metaphor repository comprising four languages. So American English, Mexican Spanish, Farsi, and Russian. Um, I say American English, although we do have some British English data in, in there as well. So that was one goal. The other goal was um, really the core of the project, which is to use this repository to identify and extract metaphor from text. So taking very large corpora, um, millions or billions of words, and then processing it to extract um, annotated um, instances of metaphors, um, usually targeted searches. So um, the government was quite interested in using this program to understand cultural differences, um, which was part of the reason why it was uh, multilingual and you can um, figure out why they chose the languages they did. Um, with the idea being, you know, how do Mexicans understand poverty versus how do Americans understand poverty or how are taxes understood in Russia versus how are they understood in Iran. Um, so most of the initial work we did was very focused on political and social issues. Um, however, to do so, this did require um, doing the underlying conceptual work in addition to the, the social and psychology work. Okay. So that was the initial objectives. Um, since then, the project has um, changed quite substantially due to changes in funding. Um, so at the current state, it's mostly focused on just English and um, we're focusing more on core metaphor analysis um, and expanding that rather than um, focusing on the, the specific domains um, originally asked for by the government. So um, this is a very lengthy diagram that kind of provides an overview of the system. So we have resources, which are in the orange boxes, and then processes, which are in the green kind of ovals. And the idea is this is a very um, iterative feed forward, feed backward system, where um, we have cognitive linguistic resources, which are developed by the linguists. Um, we have um, computational elements that are informed by our cognitive linguistic theory. Um, those two together produce a database of metaphors, which is then analyzed and then is used to improve the cognitive linguistic and resources, which in turn improves the system. Um, so I'm going to not go over everything in this diagram today. I'm going to focus first on the cognitive linguistic resources because that is um, where the repository is um, stored and kind of conceptualized. Um, First, I'm going to give a very brief background on metaphor theory um, for those of you who are not familiar with it. So um, conceptual metaphor theory um, was first kind of developed in the 1980s, and this arose from the observation that we make use of metaphors extremely extensively in our everyday speech. So not just as a literary or rhetorical device, something you would see in poems and Shakespeare, but rather um, just the way we describe um, usually more abstract ideas. So um, some of the examples we have, a trend that um, experts believe will continue to climb. So there's no literal climbing. Um, we are conceptualizing a change of state, so a trend, right, um, that is increasing. And so it's conceptualized as moving upwards. Um, let's just walk through the numbers here. So um, this is understanding something is a journey, right? So you, um, you're conceptualizing um, the process of understanding as moving forwards. It's a very common metaphor. Um, moving beyond the more traditional definitions of empathy. So again, we're dealing with concepts, right, definitions, and then conceptualizing it using physical um, states, moving beyond. Um, and, you know, we can even see words like the word in can be used metaphorically. So if we say we're living in poverty, um, Technically, poverty is not a physical place. Um, there might be places associated with poverty, but poverty itself is not a location. So if you say someone is living in poverty, you're using a metaphor. And um, typically, we are completely unaware of these choices we make. So um, in the 1980s, um, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson wrote a book called Metaphors We Live By. 
um, where they basically came up with and described conceptual metaphor theory. But the idea that the less accessible concept, um, such as numbers or emotions or trends, um, are described in terms of a more accessible concept. So um, things like moving upwards, downwards, um, physical experiences. So we, we call the abstract thing the target domain and the uh, more concrete thing the source domain. And what's important here is that um, we can generalize over all of these observations such that any given linguistic expression of metaphor is an, a specific instance of a more general conceptual metaphor. So if I say, um, you know, his hopes were soaring or his hopes were dashed, um, th those are both cases of, um, you know, emotions are on a vertical scale. So, you know, happy is up, sad is down. Um, so you have specific instances, hopes are soaring, hopes are dashed, and they both are evoking a much more general um, kind of basic metaphor that we use conceptually. So that's a, a cognitive concept, not just a linguistic construct. So that is the like 30 second overview of metaphor theory. So the metaphor repository we designed um, is basically a formalization of this theory. So prior to this point, most metaphors were basically um, if you wanted to find a list of metaphors, there was kind of one floating around the internet, but it was basically just a list someone typed up. Um, there is like books that have kind of scattered examples, but um, this was really the first time um, someone sat down and decided to make a computational formalized implementation of the theory, which really required us to flesh out a lot of the details as to how this works um, on a linguistic level, on a conceptual level, uh, in a way that would um, could that could be formally implemented. So the key here is the source and target domains. Again, the the concrete and abstract parts of the metaphor are represented as semantic frames. So if any of you are familiar with FrameNet, which is also hosted at the International Computer Science Institute, um, that it, this shares the same um, theoretical framework as FrameNet does. So frames, here's a very brief example, the physical affliction frame. So we have the concept of physical affliction, which could be like harm or pain. Um, we have words that evoke this idea. So this is like a concept. And um, there are words that evoke the concept, like afflict, symptom, alleviate, sick. Um, and then we have basically the, the players or the roles in the frame. So you have the person experiencing the affliction, the patient, the symptoms of the affliction, and um, the affliction itself. Um, there's other information associated with the frame. Um, in particular, what will be relevant for us is that there are relationships to other frames. So frames are um, organized in FrameNet and in a network of inheritance. So you have more general, more specific frames, um, some of them directly inheritance, some of them make use of, so partial inheritance, and um, we make use of a similar structure that I'll show you soon. So here's what um, the physical aff affliction frame looks like as implemented in our system. So um, we use a semantic media wiki um, for the linguists to interact with rather than um, kind of asking them to get used to using a more, um, you know, technical um, interface. We use a wiki. It's very easy to use um, for the end user, and it's um, easy to read as well, except when it's familiar with how wikis work. So um, here we have basically the same information you saw previously, just as it would appear on um, the website. And as you can see, um, the physical affliction frame, we have, um, in my mouse, you have the current frame, physical affliction, and it's a subcase of harm to living entities. So we have a more general frame um, that has more kind of schematic or skeletal semantics, which is a parent of physical affliction. Um, we also note here that there are metaphors that make use of this frame. So notice physical affliction because it's a very concrete thing. It's something you can physically experience. It tends to be a source frame. So we have gun violence as physical affliction, um, indications of social problems as physical affliction, social problems are physical afflictions. So very frequently um, we think of social problems as physical harm, right? So poverty physically hurts you in addition to um, emotionally hurting you, but in a metaphorical sense. Um, or you could say, you know, poverty is a plague on society, for example. All right. 
So that's how the frames work. Um, metaphors are represented, therefore, as relationships between frames. So if we conceptualize of metaphors as mappings between source and target domains, then any given frame could, in theory, be a source domain or a target domain. And thus, we never want to tag a frame as being a source frame or a target frame. It's just that um, in any given metaphor, two frames will be in relationship to each other. So uh, conceptually, this is kind of how this works. You have two frames, downward motion and impoverishment, and together they form the metaphor becoming impoverished is moving downwards or downward motion. So these are the roles in the downward motion frame. You have the mover, you have um, the notion of verticality, you have the location, on your vertical path, and then you have the movement itself. And then you have the words that can evoke this frame, things like fall, drop, and plummet. And the, the little um, dot Vs indicate the part of speech, so these are verbs. And then in the poverty side, you have the person who's impoverished. You have um, the wealth scale, right? So poverty is relative. Uh, you have the experience of being impoverished and the fact that you're getting you know, more poor, and then the words that evoke it. And then what we see is there's a direct mapping between each of the roles. So to use the metaphor, we have to understand that the poor person is moving downwards, that becoming poor is like, um, or being poor is being on a location on the scale, and then getting more poor is moving downwards. So you have this mapping between each of these things. And the idea is at the conceptual level, this is how we're reasoning about poverty. So this kind of um, mapping is implemented in the repository. So that means essentially that the repository comprises um, a massive, um, you know, we've been thinking of it as a lattice-like network of frames and conceptual metaphors. So it's no longer a list, rather it's um, an ontology, right? So um, for example, this is a graph auto-generated by the wiki. And here we have the physical affliction um, frame and a subpart of all of the frames that are related to it. There are many more in the network that you can kind of imagine branching off. And um, this also illustrates some of the frame relations that we have encoded, right? So you have physical affliction um, is a completely inheritance um, from harm to living entity. It makes use of or partial inheritance from experienced pain and it itself is a parent of disease, which makes use of um, things like disease spread, disease treatment, and so on. Um, so this kind of gives you a glimpse of how the frame network is organized. Now the metaphors um, are part of this network as well. So again, they're represented as mappings between frames, meaning that um, any given metaphor representation in the wiki is going to have frames associated with it. So here again is a representation of our wiki. Um, we have the metaphor social problems are physical afflictions. And what you see is it has the source frame physical affliction, the target frame social problems. And these mappings are actually auto generated by the system. It says, okay, here are the roles that we have in social problems that you've just um, if you associate social problems with this wiki, I mean, with this uh, metaphor, it's going to bring up the roles for social problems. These are the roles for physical afflictions, and it's going to ask you how do they relate to each other. And here we see that just what has frames have relations to other frames in the system. Metaphors also have relations to other metaphors in the system. So the uh, metaphor of social problems are physical afflictions, um, has relationships to society as a person, um, negatively evaluated conditions are harmful agents, right? So here again, we see some partial inheritance. We also have a concept called entailment, which is a, um, rather than being an inheritance, is a um, effectively an inferential structure. So we're saying that if society is a person, therefore social problems are physical afflictions, with the reasoning being that people have physical afflictions, society has problems, and therefore, if society is a person, it must be the case that this mapping is also true. So um, this is a kind of different relationship than you might see in a typical ontology because it is um, in addition to um, you know, the more typical inheritance 
types, we're also seeing these um, effectively cognitive pragmatic um, reasoning built in as well. So this is a conceptualization, again, of um, how the metaphor network works. So you have um, your metaphor you're currently looking at, and it has different kinds of relations with other metaphors. Uh, here's the autograph generated by the system. And so you can see there's our, our current metaphor, social problems or physical afflictions. It has entailments. Um, it is entailment of um, some metaphors. There are other metaphors that are entailment of it. And then you have inheritance. So gun violence is physical affliction is a type of subcase of social problems or physical afflictions. The reason why it's a subcase or um, this inheritance from that is because gun violence is a type of social problem. So the key here is the frames and metaphors are part of the same network in reality. So um, we can kind of conceptualize it like this. Poverty is disease is a particular kind of social problems or physical afflictions. Um, and then poverty is disease makes use of poverty, which is a social problem. Social problem uh, is used by social problems or physical afflictions. And we see the same kind of inheritance relationship on the source domain side. So poverty is a disease makes use of disease. Social problems or physical afflictions makes use of physical affliction. Disease inherits from physical affliction. So this scales up massively when you start to think about um, the current size of the repository, we have around you know, 500 um, frames, around 600 metaphors, and um, that is only a representation of, the, of really a fraction of what needs to be done. Um, and, oh, again, there are specific lexical items that are inheriting, um, or, or rather evoking these words. All right, so the moving on now to the implementation, the part we actually want to talk about. So um, you can view a partial um, version of this online at um, metaphor.exe.berkeley.edu and then it'll lead you to the wiki. Um, so from the end user perspective, the wiki is modified by linguistic analysts using um, wiki forms. Basically, if you want to create a new metaphor or a new, for or a new frame, um, the form walks you through the process of um, filling everything out. And it will make a lot of suggestions and it will force you to do things. Like if you choose, um, if you're making a metaphor, you have to have both the source and target domain, for example. Um, underlyingly, you know, the wiki has an ontology um, similar to OWL, but it's, you know, uh, semantic media wiki ontology. So um, you can kind of see the, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but basically these are examples of how the metaphor and frame relations are actually implemented in the wiki. So um, for a given metaphor, it has relationship to metaphors. So that could be an entailment. It could be um, a source domain or target domain relationship, and then different kinds of subcases. Um, it could also be a parent of another metaphor. Um, it could make use of a metaphor. So these are all different metaphor relationships that we've specified between metaphors. And then on the frame side, we've specified a variety of frame-frame relations. So um, debate, but most of these are essentially different types of inheritance or um, being used as part of a um, process. So what's interesting is what it actually becomes um, converted from the semantic media representation to RDF triples um, in the process of um, identifying and extracting metaphors. So this is where the owl actually comes in. Um, so we're using a ontology defined in owl to develop uh, the um, RDF representation. And what we're going to see is we actually make use of um, the RDF triple representation framework a little differently than some people do um, for some of our um, what am I saying, for some of the representation, but this part is more kind of standard ontological, um, basically representing um, the, the network. So metaphors, frames, roles, mappings, and lexical units are all objects, so they're effectively the nodes. Um, and you'll recall the metaphors um, and frames um, are the kind of core elements of the repository. Roles belong to frames, mappings, our relationships between frames, the lexical units belong to frames as well. 
So metaphors have source and target frames associated with them. Frames have roles and lexical units associated with them. Mappings have source and target roles associated with them. And these are all um, objects in the system. So to kind of conceptualize this, here's what it looks like on the wiki. We have a metaphor, um, achieving a purpose is acquiring a desired object. It makes use of another metaphor and two metaphors. It has the frames associated with it, gain, possession, and purposeful action. And then there are mappings between the um, source roles and the target roles. Now in the underlying RDF um, triples, it's what it looks like this, right? So you have the metaphor represented here, achieving a purpose is acquiring a desired object. It has a target frame, which is purposeful action. It has a source frame, which is game possession. It has a mapping. And then this is the mapping between the two roles, right? Um, that the actor maps onto the possession, um, game possession recipient. The objective of purposeful action is mapping onto the game possession possession. And then the two metaphors it makes use of. So you'll notice that this is a little bit different than the subject predicate object. Um, you know, kind of framework in the sense that this is more defining um, a network of, you know, frame, frame, and then the relationship between the frame. Um, so that isn't necessarily um, the same idea of, you know, these are all properties of a frame, rather it's more defining relationships between frames and metaphors. Okay. So I'm gonna move on now to the extraction process um, a bit more quickly, um, just so I can show you how the extraction process makes use of um, sort of this ontology. So first we do pre-processing very standard and then we have our custom processing, which is where the actual magic happens. So there's four steps to this um, process. The first is we have a corpus, so a body of text, and we want to find a metaphor of some kind. So we might want to find all of the metaphors that describe poverty. Um, so we're going to look for words like poverty, impoverishment, destitute, et cetera. Or we may want to find all of the cases in which disease is being used as the source domain. So we would look for words like disease, uh, illness, sickness, et cetera. Um, conveniently, um, other work has shown that conceptual metaphors are expressed in particular syntactic patterns. So we can make use of the um, syntax to help us look for what's likely to be metaphoric. So for example, a very common um, pattern or construction is the source domain occurs in the verb, the target domain occurs in the argument. So in this case, um, or the noun, we'll call it that. So here we have poverty is the noun, um, threaten is the verb. And so that's the construction, subject, verb. Target domain in the subject, source domain in the verb. And in this, again, we see the source domain is in the verb and the um, target domain is in the noun, the direct object. So you get tackle homelessness. So we make use of a set of these patterns to look for potentially metaphoric expressions. Um, so um, I won't go through all of these, but here is a representation of the Target domain is in the subject and the noun. The source domain is in the verb. I'm sorry if you hear my cat yelling in the background. Indie. Okay, so the process is we, we have our terms we're looking for, such as poverty, and we're going to find every instance in which poverty occurs in a noun um, and look to see what construction it falls in using uh, the pendency parse that we've already done. So we've got poverty, in the noun in all of these cases. Trap of poverty, despair of poverty, poverty of imagination. Now, what we see here is in the first two, poverty is occurring in the second noun slot, so they match the construction. Poverty does not occur in the um, correct slot here, so it would actually get kicked out of the system. However, notice despair of poverty is not metaphoric. Trap of poverty is. So we need a second set, step that will actually decide which of these is a metaphor. Um, and 
that is making use of the metaphor likelihood estimation, which is where the, the repository really comes in. So what we do is we have this ontology that's a giant um, directed graph. And what we do is we figure out the relationship between the two words that we've found uh, in the graph and then decide if that relationship is likely to be metaphoric. So here we have um, two words that our system has found for us, cure cancer. So we are probably looking for um, cure, right? So by traversing the graph, what we see is, okay, cancer evokes the cancer frame, cure evokes treating an affliction, and there's a direct line you can draw between the two by following subcase relations. Cancer is, inherits from disease, which inherits from physical affliction, which um, is related to treating a physical affliction. So that's a non-metaphoric pattern. So that we consider this a non-metaphoric low scoring um, configuration. This is the schematized version of that. In contrast, let's, we found cure poverty. So cure, again, evokes treating and physical affliction. Poverty evokes poverty. We traverse the graph, and what we find is the shortest path between each of those, there's a metaphor in between. Now, they're not directly related in a metaphor. Um, you have to kind of move up the graph a little bit. But what we see is that there is a metaphor that relates the two of them. So this would be considered a high scoring metaphoric relational configuration, where the target frame and the source frame, they're most closely related via a metaphor. So this is implemented. Um, first, um, during our pre-processing, the input text corpus is um, represented. Each sentence is basically an RDF. And um, so at any given um, corpus is basically a giant RDF triple star. We, we use open sesame. Um, so documents, sentences, and words are all nodes in the graph. Um, properties of words are data type properties on the word nodes. So this is things like the form, lemma, part of speech are properties of words. Um, and then all of the types of relationships are object properties between nodes. So um, Words have relationships to each other, so grammatical information, um, word order. Um, words and sentences have relationships between them. So, um, for example, um, the where the word occurs in the sentence is part of this. And then um, where the sentence occurs in the document, those are properties between nodes as well. So that's all part of the pre-processing. So to do the first step of doing the constructional matching, we use Sparkle queries um, over these RDFs. So what we do is um, we had that list that you saw earlier of all of the different um, metaphors, um, not um, constructional patterns that could be metaphors, and those are translated into um, Sparkle queries. So this construction is the noun preposition noun construction, where you have the subject, I mean the source domain in the noun, there's a preposition, and then you have the target domain in the second noun. Um, I'm not going to bother walking through the um, theory here of how to read the Sparkle query, but this basically gives you a taste of um, how our constructional patterns are actually defined, how we query the RDFs. So this is a very laborious process. It goes through every single sentence to look for this construction. And it does that for every single construction. So now you have a list of potentially metaphoric expressions. Basically, we've pulled out the um, sentence indexes that um, returned positive for any of those constructional searches. The next step is to run the metaphoricity likelihood scoring over that subset of um, sentences that we've identified which again uses Sparkle queries to um, determine the relational configurations. So again, here's that metaphoric pattern we saw earlier. This is called a subcase of frames related by conceptual metaphor pattern. So you have two frames which have subcase type relationships and um, the, the frames that they are subcases of are related by a conceptual metaphor. So the Sparkle query for that relationship looks like this, where you're basically asking, does the conceptual metaphor have the target frame and source frame in it? And, or does the um, target frame and source frame have subcase relationships? 
with the actual indexed target frame and source frame. And a positive result for this query would give you a high likelihood score. Uh, we also have a set of Sparkle queries for low um, metaphoric relations as well. So all of the um, potentially metaphoric sentences as returned by the extraction system are scored using these relational configurations. The result of that is a database of linguistic metaphors or potentially linguistic metaphors. Um, and that goes into our database. So what we have is a set of expressions that are scored for metaphoricity um, annotated with linguistic information. The final step is the system converts this into a, a JSON for use in our database-based search tools, other visualization software. So basically we have a corpus database. Um, you could click this, it's a drop down, and it gives you all of the um, previous searches and results that you've done. You pick one and then you can say, okay, give me all of the metaphors where gun violence is the target domain and disease is the source domain. And you can also specify your score level. The metaphoricity is scored from zero to one, so you can say I want things that are, you know, um, you know, getting 65% or above likelihood. And then the results looks like this. So this was a search for um, money and liquid motion, it looks like. And then all of this um, information is associated with this sentence now in the system. So you have the um, frame for the source domain, fluid motion, the lemma, the word that it's uh, associated with. You have the frame for the target domain, money, the lemma that it, word it's associated with cash. You have the metaphor it identified and the construction that it occurs in. And all of this underlyingly, here's what the JSON looks like for poverty hurt. Um, so it actually gives you where in the sentence it occurs, the frames, um, the score, the metaphor associated with it, and so on. So this is the end stage of this whole process. So to summarize, um, this system goes beyond mere metaphor detection or um, you know, statistical likelihood of metaphor. The system really enables us to do a lot of different kinds of linguistic analysis of metaphors in the text. and um, it's enabled by this iterative developmental process where um, the data we extract and identify um, improves the linguistic analysis in the repository, which then improves um, the quality of the extractor output. So um, the outcomes of this include the metaphor repository, the wiki that is uh, publicly accessible. Um, if you want the underlying data in an um, I, I think we offer it in a couple different formats. You can just email us and we will send it to you. Um, some people have just scraped it straight off of the wiki without asking, which is also okay. Uh, we have this very large database of um, richly annotated examples, and then we've developed a range of tools for doing this extraction analysis. So the future of MetaNet is a transitory state. So as Ken mentioned at the beginning, I am becoming a co-PI along with Eve Sweetser, who's at UC Berkeley. Um, so we are currently in the process of actually transitioning the MetaNet hosting to UBC servers. Um, the eventual plan is um, to make the full English wiki publicly available and internally um, accessible. So if you want guest access to it, you can request it on a limited basis um, at an editor or level as opposed to a viewer level. Um, the short term goals after that server move um, is done, um, we have a lot of coverage planned to add additional frames and metaphors. Um, we want to, there's some issues with the constructional patterns queries that we need to fix. And the pipeline right now is not particularly modular in nature. It's hard to um, kind of jump in at different points in the system. You have to kind of start at the beginning every time. Um, longer term goals include um, incorporating a machine learning element. Um, I mentioned we're mostly doing just English right now. We're hoping to revive the Spanish language section and also expand text coverage to fiction. Right now we only have um, nonfiction, mostly news genre texts, which are a little boring. All right, so um, I have a couple of selected references. Um, you probably be most interested in Jisip Hong's article, um, Automatic Metaphor Detection Using Constructions and Frames. Um, the journal is often not um, available. A lot of institutions don't have um, 
subscriptions to it, so I'm happy to email any of these to you. Uh, we have a couple overview um, articles in edited volumes, and then uh, my paper on um, in constructions and frames really gets into details as to the specific relationships designed between frames and metaphors in the system, if you're interested in that. Um, so I have to thank the entire MetaNet team um, who have worked on this, especially the other linguists, George, Eve, Jacob, Ellen, Juana, Carrie, and Luca. Um, one of the reasons why MetaNet is in such a transitory state is because almost all of them have been hired by Google. Google is um, building their own frame and metaphor ontology, and um, they went and hired all of my coworkers to go work on it. So um, good for Google, not so great for us. All right, I'm going to end there, and um, thank you very much. Thank you, that was great. Uh, we do have a number of questions already on the chat. Oh, let me go back here and see. Uh, do you have any connection to WordNet? Okay, yes, do I? Uh, no, we just use FrameNet. I can get a little bit into the relationship between FrameNet and MetaNet if you're interested in that in particular, but the short answer is just FrameNet, not WordNet. Okay. Um, is David asked about the inferencing that you're doing? Um, yes. So this is a really um, interesting part of the system, which um, linguists are okay with and not everyone is okay with. Um, I'll, I'll acknowledge that. So the, one of the key parts of the system that distinguishes it from other computational metaphor models is the role of the linguistic analysis um, in the design of the system. So when it comes to inferencing, this is basically human inferential structure, meaning it's done by humans with the intention of representing um, how we think, how we reason about the world. Um, it is grounded in psychological science in that um, this has been independently verified by people who study um, metaphor and reasoning. So nothing we propose as far as the entailment and inference process goes is particularly controversial from that perspective. Um, however, it does mean that there are humans doing this and there are errors in the system. Um, sometimes there's duplicates that end up and which is why the the number of frames and metaphors is always a little in flux because we do have to go in. Um, we've implemented a review system where everything has to be proposed and then approved by a supervisor who will hopefully um, you know catch those kinds of mistakes. Um, we also do these as teams so um, any given entailment or proposed relation has been um, vetted by the kind of group process rather than any individual, um, you know, going it alone with their analysis. But it is humans. I'll just say that. Okay. That's... All right. There's still more questions. Yeah. Uh, but uh, let's see. Mark would like to speak now. Mark. Can you, uh, yeah, sure. you're unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thanks. Very fascinating discussion. Yeah, it was around in the 80s when this first was talked about. Mm -hmm. I almost forgot about this fun work. Um, so I try to keep this short. There's work on the engineering side of this to build model-based system engineering in which you can try to use analogies to explain what's inside the model. But most people work sort of in the opposite direction of trying to uh, reason backwards toward the model. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if there's been any work that allows engineers to leverage the existing frames that you're working on so that things like inside the network or uh, inside the server or uh, as you know, the part and whole relations and that sort of mm -hmm. common language uh, enablements that you get from um, these kinds of analogies could be paired with more 
highly specific models developed by engineers? Sorry, it's kind of a confusing question. I mean, the, the short answer to your question is no, in the sense that we haven't done any of that work ourselves. Um, like, like I said, some people have actually been making use of our data without really talking to us about it. So it could be that that, that has been done and that I don't know of. But um, the short answer, I think, is as far as I can tell, no. Um, okay. Yeah, as far as the, the kind of working backwards thing, um, we, we take a very explicitly bottom-up approach um, in contrast to a lot of the other approaches that work backwards towards the model, in part because what we've seen of um, projects that use statistical modeling only, um, where essentially they do a lot of cluster analysis um, to make predictions of what's likely to be metaphoric, produce um, worse results than the um, bottom-up human-generated model that we, we work with. No doubt. Interesting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. But you do you do think that machine learning might have a role to play, nevertheless? Yes. So in the discovery process. Um, so one thing that we would like to do is um, work on identifying gaps in the system. So by instead of basically starting from raw data and producing generalizations, which is the way the peer statistical models do, um, by working with the extant structure we already have. So we, we have pretty good coverage as far as what we call you know, core conceptual models goes. So um, basically the building blocks of the world, um, things like movement, verticality, containers. I saw containers in the, the chat. Yes, we have lots of representations of containment. Um, so the schematic elements of the world are well represented. So because we have um, you know, good world knowledge already in the system and the core metaphors making use of that world knowledge, um, we can leverage that to identify gaps in these specific level metaphors. So rather than trying to um, generate metaphor relations from scratch, we, what we want to do is effectively um, use the machine learning to use the, um, the extant repository as kind of the training um, set, if you will, and then try to see if we can find new specific metaphors we haven't put into the system um, in that pro way, instead of using a pure statistical model where they're just generating um, you know, predicting cluster relations from nothing. Uh, but that, that's kind of probably a few years off. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now so um, I, I'd like to address um, Terry's question. Does linguistic analysis involve establishing or measuring or judging the appropriateness of particular metaphors? Yes. So um, why is a raven? Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I like the um, Lewis Carroll. Um, so the metaphor identification process um, isn't necessarily a notion of appropriateness, but rather usage based. So cognitive functional linguistics could be kind of considered synonymous with usage based linguistics in the sense that we are interested in um, looking at language as people actually use it. So um, Sometimes this is literally doing Google searches to see if a particular linguistic expression um, has high occurrence on the internet. Um, sometimes um, this, we, well, another thing we've done is we've actually um, done some pilot work with working with um, linguistic metaphor, anal like trained metaphor analysts, giving them surveys and um, lists of um, metaphor metaphoric language and actually asking them to evaluate, you know, on a Likert scale of one to seven, how metaphoric is this usage? Because metaphoricity, um, by some accounts, is actually more of a spectrum than a binary. Um, and so the linguistic analysis involves um, identifying expressions that are actually used, so specific linguistic expressions, and combined with our pre-existing understanding of the core conceptual network. So very um, general level metaphors. 
So there's a lot of other work in the literature demonstrating that specific and novel metaphors make sense to people only if they evoke a pre-existing basic level metaphor. So, um, and this has been shown kind of both at the behavioral level and at the um, neurological level as well in doing um, EKG, ERP studies. So um, linguistic analysis involves a lot of different approaches in this sense, but ultimately the question is, do people actually use it and do they understand it? And if the answer is yes, then it um, can justifiably be considered a metaphor. Um, some uh, Pat Cassidy, I believe that was Pat Cassidy, had his hand up, but, but then took it down. And now Todd has his hand up. Yeah, I, I have a few questions, Elise. Thank you for the mm -hmm. presentation. Um, one question is, what corpus of material did you use or do you use? We use um, a variety of corpora. Um, most com frequently in my own research using MetaNet, I've used COCA, the corpus of um, contemporary American English. Um, we've also used the English GigaWord corpus quite a bit um, as well. Um, like I said, mo most of the work we've used is nonfiction texts of various kinds. The GigaWord is very heavily weighted towards news, um, newspapers. Okay. And um, have you looked at, shall we say, the historical perspective? That is, how stable are metaphors over mm -hmm. a period of time? And does that make a difference to yeah. what you're doing? So, um, Yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that people on the team, um, Eve is actually a historical linguist who has done quite a bit of work on um, historical cognitive semantics. And so we're highly aware of semantic change. Um, everything in the database as it stands is contemporary. So there, there's a whole different debate about what a dead metaphor is or isn't that I won't get into, um, but the, the repository itself is contemporary and mm -hmm. the corpora we work with are contemporary. There's no reason why you could not use the um, repository and extraction system on historical corpora. You would have to add information to the repository that reflected historical usages, but that would totally be something you could do. Oh, okay, one last question so others can ask. Um, how are the relations among the frames introduced? Mm -hmm. how, how yeah, you... so that is also a um, usage-based bottom-up process. Um, the, the short answer is I'd recommend you read my paper because it really walks through the, the reasoning behind it. Uh, essentially what we do is we started off with um, the core okay. set of relations that FrameNet has and um, started with that and then as we were working on building the repository it swiftly became apparent when another relation was needed well, so this no, was no. kind of yeah i'm sorry not not the relations you're using mm -hmm. but instances of the relations oh how do they get yeah. instantiated um i'm not sure my in, instances of the relations like you, you know, mean like the examples that we have or well, the examples that you showed us you had some um relations uh, i'm looking at slide what 42 and or I'll go back to another better one would be uh, da, 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 where is it? I know you have them in here. Um, well, you have several slides, and you have um, I guess how about slide nineteen? It says metaphor network. Okay, let me go to that. Um, and and slide. you have yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I see what yeah. you're saying. Um, and you actually, have, maybe slide twenty is better. Okay. Yeah. So how how do we have those relations? Basically, no, no, no. Um, how do they get instantiated? So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, those relations occur as a result of adding new metaphors to the system. So, for example, um, so the, the slide we're looking at is the social problems are physical affliction slide. Right. Um, is that that's the main metaphor and then there's a metaphor that's a subcase of it gun violence is a physical affliction so gun violence is a physical affliction was not one of the first things we started with right so that used to not be there <laughs> and then we were asked to study gun violence and again through this usage-based approach i've been talking about 
um, you can find lots of evidence that gun violence is metaphorically understood as a, a social problem that hurts economies, it hurts societies, yeah. right? Gun violence plagues the nation, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. So that means we've identified the metaphor and um, because of the nature of the frame network, when we say, when we put in physical affliction, it's going to ask us how it relates to other metaphors that relate, that have physical affliction as a source domain. So but basically so because you're plugging into the extant network in that sense, but are you it asks us, is there a relation? Then we would say yes. Oh, so it's done manually and not automatically. Yeah. It, it, it is, I would say, partially, all, um, I would say semi, but a little manual and a little, well, no, no, a little automated rather, in the sense that the system will prompt you. Oh, okay. The, the wiki is designed to lead the user um, to think about these sorts of questions. So it's, it's providing an aid for your decision as a human. Exactly, yeah. Um, one of our goals is to actually further automate generation of um, aspectual and causal variations on metaphors. So if you have social problems or physical afflictions, that means causing a social problem is causing a physical affliction, for right. example, right? And so that is something that the system will be able to generate automatically is um, the hope. Uh, one last question. I don't know if you can answer. If you were to use a substantially different corp corpus of materials on which mm -hmm. to base the work, or have you, or I should ask this, have you compared the results you get among the relations of the different metaphors, assuming that there's some commonality of metaphors across substantially different domains of, mm -hmm. uh, have you looked at that comparison? So at a relational level, um, we, the system or the theoretical framework would say that the relations are the same because this is um, built to be a representation of um, our cognition rather than any particular body of um, well, text. Well, again, right? not, nece not necessarily the relations on which the you construct your graph, but the mm -hmm. instances of those relations, yeah. assuming that there's some commonality mm -hmm. among the metaphors used. Yeah, um, what we have found is that there, there's considerable um, distributional and usage differences between okay. texts. Um, you know, we, we did a kind of pilot study of um, poverty, for example, between um, Spanish and English and found some really interesting differences. Mm. Um, you know, they, they both use poverty as a location. Um, however, American English is far more likely to conceptualize poverty as a location you move out of, whereas Mexican Spanish tends to treat it like a place you stay. <laughs> so you, you get things like that. Okay. Well, thank yeah. you. Uh, we did have another. Yeah, and I saw there are more questions. Uh, um, synecdical statements. Um, where was that? Mike question? Bennett. Do you treat synecdical statements as metaphor? Twelve fifty-five is the timestamp. Okay. Okay. Do you treat synecdical statements as metaphor? Um, so we we take a broad view of metaphor, um, kind of moving away from the literary definitions. So. Um, but we do make a distinction between metaphor and metonymy. So um, synecdoche is a type of metonymy. Um, you give an example, part whole, right? That's metonymy as well. So those would be relationships um, between frames rather than relationships that constitute a metaphor. Um, part whole, for example, is a within frame relationship where a role in the frame evokes the whole frame. Um, metonymy is where one either a frame evokes itself or one frame evokes another related frame. Um, you know, the example of this is um, when you say, you know, have you read Margaret Atwood, meaning her book, not Margaret Atwood herself. Um, so those are not metaphor relations because it's not a mapping between two unrelated domains. Um, so those um, relations are much more fleshed out in FrameNet than they are in MetaNet. Um, we would like to make use of metonymy because it is another type of um, figurative language that should be part of the system eventually, but at this time, no. Lovely, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I had 
I had a question about uh, some of the developments that I had been uh, at one of the early uh, uh, workshops when FrameNet was first being developed, and I mm -hmm. wondered how much of the uh, uh, work that was done on uh, metaphors and uh, at Berkeley with uh, um, Fillmore and others mm -hmm. and FrameNet, and how that's related to other work at uh, Berkeley by Lakoff and uh, uh, their group on. Uh, yeah. Or do you have much uh, interaction with them, or is this oh, or is yeah. completely um, separate? The well, a lot of people have actually worked on both FrameNet and MetaNet. Um, I'm not one of them in particular, but um, Ellen did a, a, a lot of substantial work in both fields. She's also one of the people who developed embodied construction grammar, which is the kind of third piece of this um, story. Um, so yes, there is very heavy personnel overlap as well as um, theoretical overlap and MetaNet is heavily informed by FrameNet. So something I didn't talk about as the relationship between the two. So um, some MetaNet frames are based on FrameNet frames. Um, one of the things I didn't show you is we actually have a entry on the MetaNet frames for um, closest related FrameNet frame. There's been some work done by the FrameNet folks um, actually looking to leverage MetaNet um, to improve their own um, metaphor relations coverage and working on aligning the two because they are kind of informed um, by different um, approaches in the sense that, for example, um, FrameNet might have a single frame for both upward and downward movement, whereas we need two different frames for that because they have different inferential structure. Um, we tend to be splitters where they tend to be lumpers is kind of the way we think about it. So we can't make direct use of FrameNet, but we're heavily informed by FrameNet in a variety of ways. Okay, um, I, th yeah. that, I think that's good. And uh, one of the uh, points that I was making some comments on the chat room, and uh, one of the points that I was making is that the underlying logic for all the frames is actually a very simple subset of logic, mm -hmm. but the really hard part, it comes in in the, in the language understanding. And yeah. I, uh, I really strongly approve of the idea of using uh, construction grammars of various sorts. And there's a, there, there are many different variations, but the basic idea of constructions being a kind of a bottom-up development mm -hmm. rather than this theoretical version from universal grammar is uh, a very important distinction. I have much more faith in uh, the uh, construction grammar than I do in anything that uh, Chomsky and his uh, group have been doing. That they're sort of often the uh, uh, boondocks of trying to get a formal theory that uh, is really very different from anything that actual people do. I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the construction grammar has come up a couple times now. So um, MetaNet makes use of um, effectively what we could call argument construction grammar. So argument constructions um, kind of informed by, um, for those of you who are familiar with these variations, Berkeley construction grammar. Um, the most relevant construction grammar for us is embodied construction grammar um, because it is a computational implementation and um, the ECG folks have been actually working on incorporating metaphoric constructions into um, ECG via the metaphor um, constructions that we've developed um, instantiations of for MetaNet. Okay and I, I as I said I the uh, one of the things that's important is to relate uh, natural language uh, processing to the formalism that is used when you're talking about specific applications, that when you're talking mm -hmm. about computer applications, you need to get down to very precise formal definitions, but somebody has to relate different implementations of these formal ontologies to one another, and that's always done by going to the ordinary language definitions that uh, if you get down to the formalism you discover that this guy's formal implementation is totally inconsistent with somebody else's but at the level of the information interchange they're all using 
uh, definitions that can be stated in ordinary language and what the kind of things they do with knowledge graphs and uh, and the metaphors so that uh, that level of understanding of the natural language is essential for interoperability among independently developed formal systems. So I don't know enough about um, knowledge graphs myself to make a comment on that, but I will say on the linguistic side of thing, we have the exact same problem of well, um, use of terms to refer to the same thing, but not um, using ordinary language to describe it, and therefore there's a lot of miscommunication. Yeah, well, basically a knowledge graph is a very simple, knowledge graphs are simple subsets of logic that can be trans represented in a frame of some sort, or in RDF, or in uh, just that subset of English mm -hmm. that uses only two quantifiers, there exists and sure. the conjunction and. Mm -hmm. So it's a very simple subset of logic, uh, and right now, uh, there's a huge amount of hype about knowledge graphs because people who are working with uh, AI and, no and various applications are using knowledge graphs to represent immense amounts of information in various documents in a way that's computable. So uh, I think for purpose of advertising things, if you want to sell uh, projects to uh, 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 people who have money, it's mm -hmm. important to use the same buzzwords they understand. And knowledge graph, as far as I'm concerned, is nothing but a buzzword for a trivial subset of logic. And uh, so I can say, oh, yes, of course we support it. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, anything that supports and and there exists supports knowledge graphs. But uh -huh. the thing is, there's a huge amount of hype there. So for practical purposes, if you want to get money from, shake down money from funding agencies, it's important to relate to the uh, buzzwords that they use. Right. Yeah. And I, now that I've moved to Canada, I'm learning there's a whole different set of buzzwords that funding ag agencies use that uh, I need to learn about <laughs> as well. Um, I wanted to address there, there was another question that came up. Um, is repository an inflated term for database? Yeah, I, I'd say that's fair. It's a database. Um, uh, someone commented that the, uh, there's a lot of influence from linguists in our vocabulary. Um, a lot of the design of the repository or wiki is intended to be um, non-threatening to linguists, basically. So even the word database can be a little scary for some of them. Um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't say there's an actual semantic difference between those two. Uh, Janet had a uh, question couple of questions. Janet, can you unmute? Hi, yeah. Uh, two related questions. One is you said that you don't want to um, specify whether a given frame is a source frame or a target frame because mm -hmm. they can be used in either position. But I was wondering if you had observations that certain kinds of frames um, are more likely to be used as a source or a target. And yeah, absolutely. And theory about that. Mm -hmm. And then sort of a similar question about, you mentioned a basic metaphor. Do you have observations and theory about what makes a um, metaphor more basic? Yes, so to answer the first question, um, right, so I, we don't want to say anything is a source or target domain um, because um, they can be used both ways, oftentimes. So uh, one of the examples you saw was, you know, um, trap of poverty, where poverty is the target domain, but we also have poverty of imagination, where poverty is the source domain in that case. Um, so even something as abstract as um, impoverishment can be, in theory, a target domain in some contexts. However, what we do see is that the um, relationship between source and target domain is asymmetrical in the sense that highly typically source domains are um, what we consider, well, the technical linguistic term is um, intersubjectivity. So the kind of lay definition of that is something that is more intersubjective is something that you and I can see and share together. Um, we used to use phrases like physical experience or concrete to describe that idea as well. Um, now we've moved in the kind of more modern cognitive theory to intersubjectivity. So something that is more intersubjective is more likely to be the source domain. Something that is less intersubjective is likely to be the target domain. So I can't see your emotions. I might see evidence of your emotions, 
but I can't actually experience your emotions the way you experience them. So that's a less intersubjective thing. Whereas um, if I see you running, you know, I understand what's going on, right? There's lots of physical evidence of a person moving. So that like, if you look at the proportion of how often something is used as a source domain or a target domain, that is um, highly predictable by um, how intersubjective it is, is the, the short answer to the, the first question. The second question, um, let me refresh my mind here. You asked about um, basic uh, metaphors, right? So there's um, some work that's been done on this, um, really starting in the 90s, on the idea of what are called primary or basic metaphors. And these are the metaphors that are most likely to be universal or nearly universal. So that means that there's a lot of cross-cultural and cross-linguistic evidence for them. Um, and they occur again and again in different contexts and different languages, essentially. So I've been using more is up, less is down um, quite a bit in my examples because that is likely to be um, the most universal of metaphors. And what makes something a basic level metaphor is the fact that you have direct physiological experience associated with the metaphor. So you can imagine um, as a baby, you're sitting playing with your toys and you're stacking your blocks. And the more blocks you stack, the higher it gets. So you have a physical direct experience, more is up. And then you knock the blocks down, there's fewer blocks in the pile, you have lesses down. Um, another example of a basic level metaphor is intimacy is closeness. So we say that we're close to our friends and distant from our enemies. That comes from the physical experience of um, you know, parents holding their children. You, know, you hug someone when you're close to them. So basic level metaphors are those that are deeply grounded in physical experience from an early age. So that means that they're, they're truly conceptual and cognitive rather than linguistic. Great, um, yeah, very helpful and interesting connection between um, that uh, explanation for basic metaphors and then the source frame mm -hmm. um, choice. So almost one could have like an algebra of, um, uh, no, is there an, an effort to identify the collection of of base um, universal metaphors. Um, you know, I, I know I've seen this over the years, but has mm -hmm. progress been made on? Um, uh, I don't know if there's exactly any project to identify like a complete list of potential universals or potential um, near universals. Uh, Zoltan Kovacis has done a lot of work on this uh, cross-cultural metaphor. So I'd say he's kind of the go-to for that kind of um, research. Mm -hmm. That would see that would make a very interesting ontology um, basis. Yeah, so um, I can speak briefly actually to the multilingual part of this. So the way that um, we have kind of developed the other languages in um, the English one kind of just by nature was the most developed. So what we tried to do was um, label metaphors that we considered to be basic or likely to be cross-cultural in nature. And those were auto-populated into the other um, languages repositories. And then those were vetted by um, native language metaphor analysts. So um, we did try to do some work on that at a limited level. This um, metanet, the English metanet also formed the basis of a separate project on um, Croatian metaphor, where they did the same thing, where they imported um, all of the basic level metaphors from metanet into their system and then populated it with Croatian specific examples. Okay, I'd like to make a comment about uh, the cross-linguistic things. There's a huge amount of work that's been done uh, by uh, the cognitive linguists, and in particular, Anna Vyazhbitska from yes. Australia mm -hmm. has been doing a huge amount of work on uh, a representation. She has a very simple English, uh, sort, of a, a sort of a kind of a controlled English that she uses for defining uh, terms in different 
languages, and she she's very mm -hmm. careful to represent the distinctions, the subtle distinctions between things that seem to be similar but are actually quite different across one language or another. And uh, so uh, you just uh, uh, look for Wierzbitska. It's spelled the way it's pronounced in Polish, but uh, a little bit different in English. And uh, she has a huge amount of work on that. Uh, I also uh, put a citation to a uh, a review that I had written about uh, Lakoff and Johnson's work uh, in uh, the, that uh, Lakoff.pdf, and it comments on some of those issues and has some references to some other things. And the basic point is there's an immense amount of subtlety, and when you get into the really the nitty gritty details, uh, they're very, very different. And there, uh, oh, another person I mentioned is Daniel Everett, who has yes. been do doing yeah. work th th with the Piraha uh, language in uh, the Amazon. And they have a radically different kind of uh, language uh, that is uh, uh, almost unintelligible uh, to uh, uh, people when other, that know other languages. And the Piraha people themselves have an extreme difficulty in uh, learning other languages, especially uh, Brazilian, which uh, uh, the Brazilian dialect of Portuguese, which is surrounding them all the time. And uh, so uh, Everett has written quite a bit about that. And one thing that he, uh, he had been trained as a linguist uh, learning so, sort of the uh, Chomsky style of thing. And he very quickly discovered that that was hopelessly impossible to represent uh, uh, the Parahan language. And the uh, thing that he enjoys uh, talking about is the way uh, Chomsky and linguists come and try to uh, do anything with Parahan and really have a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I'll, I'll comment first on Dan Everett. Um, I will say his work is certainly not without controversy. <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of people <laughs> think that, that um, either he's misrepresented the Piraha or his, um, some people think that his own data even contradicts his claims about um, some of that. Um, there, there's also a lot of issues of um, the extent to which different groups of Piraha have been more or less taught other languages. Um, there, there's a, a whole backstory to this. Anyway, um, the, I also wanted to comment on, um, yes, it's Piraha, P-I-R-H-A, I believe. Um, anyway. Yeah, with uh, a, a little circumflex well, on top. Yeah. Um, Anna Virginska, um, her work is very interesting. It's actually quite different than um, the kind of work we're doing. You know, she works in, um, semantic meta language and the concept of semantic primes. So um, on the, the surface, it, we share a lot in the common in the sense that we are both quite interested in the, um, you know, what is kind of semantically primary or basic um, from a conceptual perspective, um, you know, but she works in this formalism known as um, semantic meta language. So it's a, a very different approach than ours. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I, I understand that they're very different, mm -hmm. but the, w one thing is that we're all trying to get at artificial intelligence and natural language and relating the two mm -hmm. and also relating them to practical applications. So there's an immense amount of work that still re remains to be done, but uh, I was just commenting on the different uh, uh, methods. And I oh, also absolutely. agree that uh, that, that uh, Everett's work is controversial and uh, uh, and I and it, and certainly it is true that uh, it is possible to teach the younger uh, people in the Piraha uh, if you take them and really give them some serious training. It's possible to get them to count, to learn how mm -hmm. to count and do things. But again, so they're not uh, uh, their their capability is. Um, the same as any human anywhere, but the mm -hmm. point is that their language is so very different and their whole way of thinking is so different that uh, the people who get uh, familiar with that way of thinking just have an immense difficulty in relating it to other languages. And it, then it goes also back to uh, Benjamin Lee Worf and uh, Sapir sure, yeah. and those guys. And they had, uh, there's an immense amount of differences as you go from different places in the detail. But um, uh, again, all of this work has to be related one way or another. And I think the research is still very far from being completed. Mm -hmm.
right. Um, are there any other questions just, that so I missed? One more person with the, his hand yeah. up. Uh, Pat Cassidy has had his hand up for a while. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what. Pat, are you there? I'm trying to un. Okay, okay, I got it now. Okay. Uh, no, I couldn't unmute. I was trying. No, quick question. Um, um, if uh, one of the things you consider metaphors, if, you, if you're extracting metaphors, and one of them actually happens to be already in a dictionary, is it considered a metaphor? Or a, I mean, what? Absolutely. Do you, yeah. do you, you exclude things in a dictionary from being metaphors? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, in fact, that, that's really one of our, our key premises is that um, dictionaries include metaphoric um, D okay. meaning without making a distinction and that's really what we're interested in so my my classic example of this is um the metaphor understanding is grasping so to understand something is to hold it as if it were an object so we very frequently say things like i don't grasp that concept um or i can't i couldn't get, wrap my head head around it or i couldn't get a hold on it right <laughs> so those are all metaphors for like not understanding and if you look up grasp in the dictionary it's likely to have um, understand as a definition and our, our whole um, purpose is to um, tease that apart essentially and uh, okay. identify the patterns um, underlying that okay I, I grok <laughs> yeah yeah um, grok is not a metaphor <laughs> because um, having I did read that book and I still don't know what grok means <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's a metaphor in um, that culture, but not in English. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I believe that's the last question. So I want to thank uh, Elise. Uh, this is a very informative meeting. Um, thank you. Yes. This very has been, pleased um, with it. Really useful for me as well. Yes. Uh, um, we did run a little over, but I think it was mm -hmm. worth it. So yeah, I will uh, stop.